are not Freeman disks because we have turbulence. And as Andy has pointed out and many others know, that means you have a pressure term, a radial pressure term due to the, uh, uh, the random motions such that the rotational, effective rotation velocity is the circle of velocity squared minus this term here, which increases if sigma naught is constant. Now sigma naught in, say, this case you can measure is constant, okay? Uh, so in the cases where we, in the individual rotation curves, we do see that the sigma naught stones, you know, become smaller. So that by, by itself is very interesting because what causes the sigma naught out there with the star formation rate already is fairly low. But never mind, you have to correct for this. So this uh, thin exponential disk model then turns into this thick exponential disk model with asymmetric drift correction. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. And you see now, this in fact uh, mimics these ver various rotation curves quite well for the type of V over sigmas which we are measuring. So part of the falling off is due to the asymmetric drift correction. It has to be there, and there it is. But even if you uh, correct for it, you still have actually fairly little space for dark matter. And that's summarized now in this fairly complicated plot, I apologize, don't have that much time, where we write down the dark matter fraction at the typical radius of R1 half, a little above R1 half, as most people are doing it. Say, for instance, in the uh, Dutton and Courteau paper, and that's where, in fact, that, that, that plot is taken from, as a function of VC. Now, it's cluttered with data, both at low redshift and high redshift. So the news is, and then the, the belief is that the low redshift late type disks, which are these objects here, here's the Milky Way, by the way, and various other uh, estimates from, from the rotation curves uh, from Dutton and, and Courteau, uh, follows this, this green line. So it's such that at the, at the uh, R1 half, so, uh, you know, dark matter fractions are sizable, but then some more massive uh, disk galaxies are maximal already. Okay? So that's the general wisdom you'll find. The error bars are substantial. Now, the zero, redshift zero late uh, early type galaxies, the passive galaxies in the Capillary et al. work, uh, follow this track. So they have, at least in the, what you would call the, the mid-mass range, uh, very low dark matter fractions. The belief system is that the increase here is due to the late time accretion of uh, uh, you know, minor merger uh, systems. Uh, so now here we are. These are the two points from Moitz et al., which I've just shown you, at redshift 2 and redshift 1. So that involves measuring the dynamical mass, measuring the stellar mass, uh, inferring the molecular mass and dividing these two. Now that, of course, is, is sensitive to all the evils, right? You know, it's sensitive to, to the stellar mass modeling, the IMF, and the, 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 the gas scalings. Now then there are these outer points. This is from the rotation curves and the individual rotation curves, which I'll show you, with two sigma upper limits here. And you see they, they show very low dark matter fractions. And they're falling such that as you go to f higher out in, 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 in radius, uh, you know, that, that low dark matter fraction will be there, although as you go from 1.3 to 3, uh, one half, you generally would expect sort of a move on, movement of these points upward. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you that we are finding, especially at Redshift 2, Baryon-dominated uh, galaxies, which within the R1 half radius, leave relatively little space for dark matter. And you see that continuing as you go out into the halo. Okay, how far will we have to push that uh, still further? And we believe that this is not as strained as you might think initially, because the descendants of these galaxies, namely the mid-mass redshift zero uh, uh, zeros and elliptical galaxies show the same phenomenon. So the only thing we have to explain then is why it is that at high redshift galaxies are more baryon dominated, but that is too hard for an experimental uh, uh, physicist. Two minutes, oh my god. Okay, so the quenching is an easy subject as we know. Uh, <laughs> what should I say? We have all these wonderful theoretical ideas, how it happens. You, you have discussed this, I'm sure. We know 
that the strongest correlation between the quenched state and any other parameter of the galaxies are internal properties. Surface index, uh, local uh, uh, surface density in the central part, bulge mass, and so forth. So that, of course, incites us to think that, that, that uh, the, the quenching process is one where galaxies grow along the main sequence, and then they make a transition also structurally at some point and become small uh, things, uh, quenched objects. Well, actually, you know, now we have two ways of doing this. One is the slow way where, you know, we take into account that galaxies at early times were small, and so they can make that transition directly without much ado, but over a slow period, or we let them grow, and then we make a structural change. So we don't know which one of the uh, two it is. Uh, the theorists say, oh, well, it's complicated. It could be both. So in the radius mass range, most galaxies grow, as seen observationally, in this, with this slope, but then there are various ups and downs here, in particular downs, due to so-called compaction events, uh, trans transport of angular momentum. So it is interesting that several of our community, in particular Lillian Carollo and Van Dokkum et al., have written papers lately which I find very impressive because they are challenging the, the widespread opinion we, some of people here have, me too, which is that the internal processes are important, maybe dominant. They say, nah, all of this you can understand as a slow growth in radius, the slow mode from you know, early progenitors, which were small, and then the quenching, which is along a quenching line of 230 kilometers per second. That velocity dispersion turns out to be, roughly speaking, the threshold of a cold to hot halo. So then you don't need anything inside. In fact, in the Lilly paper, they show that all these wonderful correlations which I've shown you before can be mimicked at least to first order. It is challenging. Now, since I have only zero, zero uh, minutes or something like this, let me say, however, to Lilly, and to Van Dokkum and all the other good friends, there are indeed very important uh, observational uh, supports for the, uh, for the internal processes. There is a few years ago from our work, uh, and also Sandro Takella, uh, evidence that the inner parts of the galaxies become sterile, Q greater than one in the inner parts. There is from Nelson and Takella's work uh, uh, evidence for H-alpha deficits uh, in the centers of galaxies. There is the Bauer work which shows that there are the equivalents of the red nuggets already in the star forming stages. And then the most recent uh, uh, you know, continuation of this, that indeed these, red these blue nuggets, and this is from Burke by Bauer et al. 16, as well as from a paper in our group from Ken Tadaki, basically showing the same thing that they are in the centers of these massive blue nuggets, uh, massive blue nuggets, they are very compact, very dusty, highly star-forming entities, which you don't see in H alpha because they're so highly obscured. So they're central starbursts, which could grow indeed into a central region, which is a lot of mass once it's cleared out. And finally, they are flat, generally flat uh, uh, chemical gradients, which would also speak for uh, radial transport. And in fact, uh, 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 various arguments that the red sequence object at Redshift 2, at least, have come about in a very short period of time. I would see all this evidence is not consistent with the slow progenitor explanation only. So I personally believe the story is likely going to be very complex, but uh, you know, I think, I think it's a both uh, kind of an answer. Finally, let me comment on the AGN outflow as of the last thing. I mean, um, for, I mean it's, it's very clear now that without selecting AGNs as such, the fraction of objects at high mass, near the Schechter mass, which shows nuclear outflows, nuclear outflows, is about 60%. I mean, the error bars have shrunk uh, in the KMOS uh, survey now to the extent since we have about 100 galaxies per bin. And that's much greater than the AGN fraction. So please, let's not look at the AGNs. Let's look at the entire population and then ask the question whether or not the amount of uh, energy dumped into the 
galaxy indeed is or is not sufficient and does or does not couple into the galaxy and as such uh, makes an impact. Uh, I should say uh, also this one is not causation. Because while you might say, oh, okay, well, this goes up exactly at the, at the Schechter mass, so it's AGN feedback. Uh-uh, not necessarily. You know that the outflow rate is likely proportional to the inflow rate, and that's the Bondi rate, and the Bondi rate goes in the mass of the black hole squared, and the uh, mass of the black hole is proportional to the galaxy mass, so this is a nonlinear equation, right? So, you know, it may, may just show us that the galaxy get more massive, and therefore they produce more outflows on average. Finally, last slide, very last slide, we, we have looked, as I, as, as I said, uh, below the main sequence. So here is the specific star formation rate, that's the main sequence, and that's the ratio of H alpha derived star formation rate to the SED derived star formation rate. So we're seeing about 20% of the low below main sequence objects we're seeing uh, have uh, very low star formation rates but substantial H alpha star formation rates. Okay, so there's gas which has come in, and we're seeing this sometimes in the outer skirts in the HST imagery, sometimes little blobs and so forth. Now, interesting, if you take a stock of the spectra of these galaxies, these 10 galaxies, that's the blue one here, and compare it to the main sequence galaxy in the same mass range, the H alpha line is very weak. In the, in the below main sequence object. What does that mean? Likely it means it's low metallicity gas. So that means indeed this is gas which you know, has come in. Uh, recently we're talking time scales of a few hundred uh, mega years. And so it is possible, at least to some extent, and for sh short periods of time, to come back from the dead. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any really short questions? Uh. It's very nice to see rotation curves at uh, redshift of two. Um, I guess uh, if you were to translate these results in the Tully Fisher relation, what would it look like, its evolution? Yeah, I mean, the Tully Fisher relation. Uh, I should say it's a very odd parameter uh, plane to, to look at this. Uh, we are doing this right now with the student, Hannah Übler. Uh, now the answer is there is an increase in the Tully Fisher offset. But the, the problem is here, uh, these offsets in Tully Fisher, you have to think there's two parameters here, the dark matter fraction and the gas fraction, and both are varying. Okay, so when, when things are changing or not changing in a Tully Fisher plane, it could be because of the gas fractions are varying, and that happens a lot between redshift uh, zero and two, and then the dark matter fractions, and that happens a lot between redshift one and two, and then they sort of work against each other. Just a very quick question. So the, the, this class of galaxies you're finding at 300 kilometer per second Vmax with declining rotation curves, do you have a sense of roughly what the variable velocities of these things should be according to abundance matching? Like, should they be sitting in 300? Yeah, that's you know? a few by 10 to the 12. Okay. okay, so these are, these are you know, normal for its class, uh, you know, with, with uh, you know, total dark matter to, to, total dark matter to, oh no, so total baryon to dark matter fractions of about 30%. Remember, Gas, yeah. right? So, so the, the general abundance matching knowledge, which you all hold, is not right uh, at high redshift because you have to multiply by about a factor of two. For the gas, of the right. For the I'm gas. just trying to get a sense of whether, 